So good morning, everybody, and welcome. I know that Peter Van Damelen, who is the director of the Joukowsky Institute, wanted to be here this morning to uh, welcome everybody to Rhode Island Hall and to the Joukowsky Institute. I also know that he had to coordinate um, his uh, son's camping excursion, and that that might push him uh, past you know, 10 in the morning. Um, so I will instead, as, as an outsider, uh, offer a welcome to the Joukowsky Institute. My name is Ben Anderson. I teach in the Faculty of History of Art at Cornell University and have, together with Felipe Rojas, um, organized today's symposium, Antiquarians, Antiquarianisms Across the Atlantic. It's very appropriate that this is occurring here in Rhode Island Hall and at the Joukowsky Institute because the origins of uh, this conference are manifold but could be traced back to a couple of conversations that Felipe had and I had here in this building a little over a year and a half ago in and around our shared interests in non-professional interpreters of ancient monuments. In Felipe's case, for example, in Roman Sardis. In my case, in uh, Byzantine Constantinople. So it was clear to us that we were studying something that was similar, but we also didn't have a ready terminology to express the nature of that similarity, what this thing was that, um, that we were studying. There were a couple of different um, languages available to think about this. I'll just say a little bit here about two, um, on the one hand, typologies of archaeology, and on the other hand, um, histories of antiquarianism. By typologies of archaeology, I mean things like a very well-known and much-read uh, essay from 30 years ago by Bruce Trigger, um, published in the journal Man, in which he distinguished between three kinds of archaeology, imperialist, colonialist, and nationalist. Um, archaeologies. In this taxonomy, archaeology is something that states do, or it's an effect of states, and it's something that they started doing quite recently. So five years after that article um, in his monumental history of archaeological thought, Trigger wrote as follows, um, the remains of the past were also used in religious observances of early civilizations. In the 16th century, the Aztecs performed rituals at regular intervals in the ruins of Teotihuacan, yet to identify such activities as archaeology, even, in quotes, indigenous archaeology, is to dilute the meaning of the word, archaeology, beyond useful limits, end quote. And it was really only at the turn of the 21st century that a number of scholars began to occupy that discursive space adumbrated by this phrase in quotes by Trigger, indigenous archaeology, and to give it a really robust uh, meaning uh, within archaeological discourse, can mention here, for example, a, a monograph in the year 2000 by Joe Watkins, Indigenous Archaeology, American Indian Values, and Scientific Practice. So that by 2007, we have an edited volume um, evaluating multiple narratives beyond nationalist, colonialist, imperialist archaeologies by Junko Habu, Claire Fawcett, and John Matsunaga, uh, in which this idea of an indigenous archaeology is something that has an equal place at the table to imperialist, colonialist, other state uh, ideologies began to receive sort of full expression. Within these typologies of archaeology, it's still very much a question of present practice. In fact, very often explicitly and politically a question of present practice, how archaeologists conduct themselves in the field today. The other model that perhaps seemed more suitable to think about what Felipe and I were doing was the sort of deep histories of antiquarianism and the real um, master narrative and masterful narrative uh, for this type of thinking was supplied by Alan Schnapp uh, in a book that was already mentioned a couple of times uh, yesterday evening, uh, published first in French in 1993 and then in English in 1994 as the discovery of the past, the origins of archaeology, which paints on a very broad canvas, um, stretching back to Mesopotamia, much of the contours of even the, the presentations that you'll hear today are already adumbrated to some degree in, in Schnapp's work a history of you know, something like what uh, Peter Miller called uh, yesterday evening, um, uh, uh, past loving peoples and how uh, their practices can be placed into conversation with each other. Much more recently than uh, Schnapp together with Lothar von Falkenhausen, Peter Miller and Tim Murray uh, edited a volume that really claimed the word antiquarianism as the, the, the title of um, this thing um, that's of common interest, world antiquarianism, comparative perspectives um, published by the Getty. This seems to promise the possibility of antiquarianism as a more flexible concept, possibly, not as loaded with the kind of positivistic baggage that archaeology um, may carry with it. 
But there's still a question of where one draws the boundaries and how the boundaries end up, uh, in absence of a sort of explicit discussion, being drawn. There's a review, for example, by Christopher Evans in the Bulletin of the History of Archaeology of this Getty volume, where he notes that casual indigenous practices are considered sufficiently respectable for inclusion, but what about non- or sub-academic mm -hmm. past collectors or investigators in Western cultures? What about ley line hunters, Scandinavian farmers, home museums, stamp collectors, or historical airfield aficionados, for example? Their omission suggests that the topic is here still very much constituted within traditional academia, in which the ethnographic is admissible, but not Western amateur non-university practitioners. And we actually won't explicitly um, get into the question of historical airfield aficionados or those other categories today either, but it does point to a broader set of questions that I think um, two in particular might help to frame the discussion today. The first would be, what is gained when we extend the historically and geographically situated concepts of antiquarianism or of archaeology um, to other places and times to which they may not be emic, um, and what's lost in that transfer? The second question is, um, what is the tertium comparationis in a comparative history of antiquarianisms or of archaeology? In other words, what are we actually studying here? Um, the day's uh, <coughs> presentations are set up according to a rough sort of relative chronology that both acknowledges and relativizes the central role of West European practices, especially the early modern, um, within the two primary geographic arenas of the conversation, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East on the one hand, and the Americas, on the other hand. So we begin first thing this morning before antiquarianisms. Um, we then move in the second panel to the moment of contact between uh, West and Central European and various indigenous uh, traditions, uh, entangled traditions, as we call this panel. And in the afternoon, we move to um, after antiquarianism. It's left to me uh, first to uh, thank um, the various uh, bodies that have made today's uh, event possible, in particular the Tchaikovsky Institute of Archaeology um, and the John Carter Brown uh, Library, the directors of both, Peter Van Donlin um, and uh, Neil Safir, and uh, the staff of both, in particular Jess Porter and Brenda de Santiago, um, and the research communities associated um, with both of those institutions, and in particular Katie uh, Steidel, a graduate student at Tchaikovsky, for helping out um, with uh, today's organization, and of course, above all, to the speakers uh, the panel chairs, and the various people who will participate uh, in the conversations today. That's to say, um, all of you. Um, so it's my pleasure to turn over the podium to Joanna Hannock from the Faculty of Classics here at Brown, who will moderate this morning's first session. Thank you, Ben, and thanks so much to Ben and to Felipe and for all of the contributors to this, but it looks like it's going to be really a wonderful conference. Um, so I just wanted to remind everybody before we get going of the questions that the, um, the organizers of the conference have posed for this panel. And I think that if we listen to the papers with those in mind, it'll help us to keep our questions and our discussion when it comes to that oriented on these, on these issues. So those questions are, what does it mean to speak of antiquarianisms before the European age of the antiquaries? And how do we define, analyze, and compare antiquarian traditions in the absence of an emic concept of antiquarianism? Um, and our first presenter is Allison Thomason from Southern Illinois University, Allison, okay, who uh, is going to be presenting a paper, Antiquarianism in Deep Antiquity, Royal Collecting of Ancient Objects in Mesopotamia. So welcome, Allison. Thank you. Okay, well, um, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Thanks for um, coming today, and thanks especially to Felipe and Ben for organizing this wonderful conference and uh, bringing together all of us past loving creatures. I just love that phrase, Peter. <laughs> um, so um, I'm happy to be returning to Brown uh, after about 25 years. I was class of 91. I've been talking to everybody about that because I just get in the groove when I get into Brown's campus. I suppose for students walking around today, I'd be considered an antiquity. <laughs> and I think Ben and Felipe, uh, again, I thank them for bringing us together for this conference. So um, 
for those of you who don't know me, uh, I think Ben and Felipe invited me based on my earlier research on royal collecting in Mesopotamia and my book on that subject. Um, so I'm commenting today, of course, on the form and function of pre-modern antiquarian practices and going very, very deep antique for you into what some people might say is some of the beginnings of antiquarian practice uh, with one of the first uh, textual cultures of the world in Mesopotamia. So you all know that in 1951, Momigliano proposed that antiquarianism, which originated for him in the 17th century in Europe, was characterized by a preference for, and I'm paraphrasing here, authentic artifacts, classification of evidence, and display of erudition. Now many of my colleagues in the field of Mesopotamian studies, and especially those that focus on texts, have declared that certain kings, scribes, and other courtly elites were indeed antiquarians with a capital A. Now since this term is so loaded, as we've been discussing, with modern connotations related to the professionalization of art history and ancient history, I prefer the terms, and this is again right in line with what Peter was saying last night, uh, I, I prefer practices, activities, or behaviors of antiquarianism with a small a. For my purposes, antiquarian practices in Mesopotamia can be described as the recognition collecting and interpretation of objects from the past, including their copying and redisplay. First, to locate us in time and space. Um, so I'm talking today especially about the first millennium BCE in the part of the world you see here kind of generally echoed in, in pink. Um, especially I'm going to be talking about northern, what's now known uh, northern Iraq, Kurdistan, that's called Assyria. But I'll also be talking about Babylonia, which is another name for southern Iraq. And the sites I'm going to be discussing, I've highlighted in yellow. Uh, they cluster around the neo-Assyrian capital cities, Nimrud, Nineveh, and around the city of Babylon in the south there. So just to locate you, I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with this map. Um, antiquarian practice in Mesopotamia had a very political role one related to collective memory and further to elite production and consumption of such memory for the purpose of political m maneuvering or legitimation. Here I turn to the work of our colleagues Susan Alcock and Ruth Van Dyke for further clarification. Collective memory is a term of social historians which they call, quote, the construction of a collective notion, not an individual belief about the way things were in the past. Furthermore, they write that social memory is often used to naturalize or legitimate authority. And this is kind of where I'm going to be coming from in this talk, because I'm focusing on royal behaviors. So archaeologists can discover what Alcock and Van Dyke call uses of the past in the past through the study of four loci of materially accessible media, ritual behaviors, narrative, objects and representations, and places. And my focus today is on locus number three, objects and representations, and I include ancient Mesopotamian texts, cuneiform tablets, as objects here. In a recent article in the World Antiquarianism volume from 2014, the Assyriologist Paul-Alain Beaulieu compiled as many instances of textual antiquarianism, that is the discovery, collection, and copying or redisplay of texts as objects, that he could find in the half million strong cuneiform record. And many of my observations here are based on his work since he's one of the preeminent textual scholars for first millennium Mesopotamia, and I'm more of an art historian, archeological trained scholar. Well, Yu argues that according to Mesopotamian notions of cosmogony, kings and their scribes, the literary elites of Mesopotamia, wish to obtain wisdom and knowledge. This knowledge and wisdom, the truth about the order of the universe, was once available through the seven sages, Apkalu in Akkadian, who controlled it. However, it and the sages had been secreted away by the gods before the Great Flood, capital G, capital F, which they sent as punishment for humans' failure to accept their fate and the gods' power. One individual alone, known as Atrahasis, or in the Gilgamesh epic Utnapishtim, might be able to get access to that lost, distant knowledge if only he could be tracked down. Well, poor Gilgamesh found him, but he could never extract the knowledge. Uh, beyond mythic figures, the scholars of ancient Mesopotamia, scribes working in schools and as courtly advisors, 
took up the mantle of retrieving ultimate wisdom and following in the footsteps of the Apkalu by seeking ancient texts to read, interpret, and copy in the process of their own education or teaching. Scribes selectively and deliberately narrowed and canonized the corpus of school texts that students copied to those that glorified their own kings. In doing such, they could also bolster their own social and political positions within the royal courts. This form of antiquarian practice, which Beaulieu and others call historiography, can be traced back as early as the 18th century BCE, when scribes from Hammurabi's dynasty copied onto clay tablets the inscriptions that they found on stone sculptures from the Akkadian period, roughly 2300 BCE. It's relevant for our purposes to note that these statues were still extant and on display in the Akor, which is the courtyard of the politically important temple to the god Enlil at Nippur, so from 18, 2300 to 1800. While there's little ekphratic description of the statues themselves, the scribes indicated in their compilation that the Akkadian labels were read from certain parts of the statues, for example, on his left side or on the pedestals. This amount, minute amount of detail, very terse labels, uh, along with extant Akkadian statuary from other Mesopotamian sites, has allowed Giorgio Butelati to offer a reconstruction of what at least one of those statues of the Akkadian king Rimush might have looked like, and I offer it here on the right. The copying and collecting of old texts, by and large, for the purpose of accumulating wisdom, was the most common form of this antiquarianism for scribes. Beaulieu catalogs several other instances in which new tablets record colophons, those are little labels, uh, that indicate they are copies of older royal inscriptions or other types of texts. Kings were soon to follow on the quest to discover and resurrect the past by seeking out and or copying ancient texts. However, with the exception of one king, Ashurbanipal, the purpose of their antiquarian text collecting was not discussed in the context of antediluvian knowledge. Now first, let's study the exception to understand the range of royal antiquarian practice in Mesopotamia. Now some scholars think it was all hot air and he was really illiterate. Uh, but Neo-Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, who reigned from 680 to 630 BCE, bragged about acquiring such wisdom in a large tablet from his archives, now in the British Museum. I, Ashurbanipal, on whom Nabu and Tashmitam, and those are the Assyrian gods of, of knowledge and writing and his consort, have bestowed vast intelligence uh, who, who acquired penetrating acumen for the most recondite details of scholarly erudition, no predecessors of whom among them having any comprehension of such matters, I wrote down on tablets Nabu's wisdom, the impressing of each and every cuneiform sign, and I checked and collated them. I placed them for the future in the library of the temple of my lord Nabu, the great lord at Nineveh, for my life and the well-being of my soul to avoid disease and to sustain the foundations of my royal throne. But his public decrees were indeed backed up by action in administrative letters, which we tend to believe a little bit more than royal inscriptions, uh, in reports and, arc and inventories. We get the impression that the royal court of Nineveh was constantly seeking to add tablets to Ashurbanipal's collection. In one letter, for example, Ashurbanipal admonishes his governor in Sippar which is in southern Mesopotamia, to, quote, hunt for the valuable tablets which are in your archives and which do not exist in Assyria and send them to me. I have written to the officials and overseers, and no one shall withhold a tablet from you. And when you see any tablet or ritual about which I have written to you, but which you perceive, or which, which I have not written to you, but which you perceive to be profitable for my palace, seek it out, pick it up, and send it to me. Indeed, more than 5,000 tablets from what modern scholars call his library have been excavated from Nineveh, amongst them copies of older inscriptions with colophons indicating the date and person who copied it. So prior to the seventh century <coughs> BCE, kings didn't really get in on the act of, the, uh, of antiquarianism as much, and Beaulieu suggests that they finally did as a way to counter, quote, a growing realization of Mesopotamian decline and this, he saw, uh, Beaulieu says, was a strategy of cultural defense 
a last gap of identity politics. So to parse this further, I think the later kings were really trying to control the collective memory of their court and subjects by connecting themselves to the heroic Mesopotamian past, which secured their positions in the line of Mesopotamian succession and therefore justified their legitimacy to their gods and their rival elites. Collecting ancient textual ob objects, that is tablets and inscriptions, was, was the most common form of antiquarian behavior in Mesopotamia in this period, that is the first millennium BCE generally, but it was not the only form. For the recognition of non-textual objects or inscribed objects that also included figurative designs was present well before Ashurbanipal amassed his library at Nineveh. The kings of Mesopotamia exhibited antiquarian behaviors with respect to ancient non-tablet objects in several ways. First, we know that the kings of Assyria and Babylonia collected heirlooms, objects that had been kept for generations. In the tomb of Sargon II's queen Ataliya, who lived in the 8th century rather than the 7th of Ashurbanipal, and this is from the Northwest Palace at Nimrud, several objects that could be considered heirlooms were found. Ataliya had a number of amulets and seals that she wore on her body apotropaically in order to combat some ailments of the head that she had in life, and she took them with her in death. Some of these objects bore inscriptions and images from antiquity. The most interesting example of this practice is a carnelian bead inscribed from the headdress of Korigalzu, which was found next to Ataliya. This Kassite king lived in southern Mesopotamia about seven centuries before Ataliya. The queen somehow acquired the stone, whether from royal treasuries at Nimrud or in other ways, and appropriated it as her own by reinscribing it with a label noting its provenience. She might also have ascribed powerful healing properties to it, as the position where it was worn on the old king's body, the head, is noted in her brief label. This stone is tangible evidence that very ancient artifacts were kept and valued over several generations and across great distances. Of course, the material of the seal, carnelian, this is a, a, the red stone that's typically originated from the Indus River Valley, had its own healing properties. But the antiquity and royal associations of the object might have made it more potent than a contemporaneous one, although she also took those into, uh, with her into death. Um, I think she had a lot of really whopper migraines, <laughs> poor woman. <laughs> uh, this coincides with Ashurbanipal's contention reiterated earlier that he collected his library, quote, for my life and the well-being of my soul to avoid disease. So in this case, antiquarian behaviors were directly linked to apotropaic conceptions of objects, and their authenticity and origins rendered them very potent. Now, collecting Kassite seals from centuries earlier was a Neo-Assyrian concern, and a few other Kassite seals were found in the tombs at Nimrud, including one dated to the reign of uh, Marduk Zakir Shumi from the 13th century BCE. The existence of the extant seals in the queen's tombs correlates uh, <clears throat> excuse me, correlates well with a fascinating text found in the archives of Ashurbanipal's palace at Nineveh. A tablet from the reign of his grandfather Sennacherib, itself an old object, right, tells the biography of a particularly important cylinder seal from second millennium Babylonia. This seal was heavily curated and reinscribed twice by two different Assyrian kings who wished to imprint their own contributions to collective memories of the ancient past. The cylinder seal, made of semi-precious lapis lazuli, was originally inscribed by the Kassite king Shagarakti Shoryash of the 13th century BCE. Shortly thereafter, the seal was then captured from Babylonia, perhaps during its sack by his contemporary, the Middle Assyrian, that's the northern king, Tukulti Ninurta I who then inscribed his own name upon it and re-gifted it back to Babylonia. The seal was then recaptured centuries later by the Neo-Assyrian king Sennacherib in his sack of Babylonia in the 8th century, and Sennacherib added his own label. He, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, after 600 years, conquered Babylon and took it out from the property of, of Babylon to Nineveh. The reuse of ancient seals on fresh tablets was a common practice as well in Mesopotamia, 
tablet from the 7th century BCE, uh, found at Nimrud, contains three impressions of older cylinder seals, one from the old Assyrian period, and one from the middle Assyrian, and one from Esarhaddon, who's the, the author of this tablet, or the, the progenitor, I guess, of this tablet, his father Sennacherib, spanning a range of 1,200 years. The use of such old seals on new tablets, in this case a treaty with a vassal, allowed the Neo-Assyrian king Esarhaddon to carve the collective memory by inscribing himself in the line of other kings of Assyria. Okay? This placement conferred more legitimacy and longevity on the vassal relationship described in the tablet. For the Neo-Assyrian kings, control of ancient objects could also signify control over enemies, and moreover, the power to retrieve lost artifacts that were essential to their versions of collective memory. Ashurbanipal Paul claims that he discovered many important Mesopotamian objects that he subsequently returned to Mesopotamia upon his capture of the city of Susa in Iran. For example, he found a statue of the goddess Nanaya, which, quote, she had been angry for 1,635 years, and she had gone and dwelt in Elam, and he returned it to her temple in Uruk. The king must have missed a few statues, as indicated by the cache of Mesopotamian sculptures discovered by French excavators in a temple to a local <coughs> Elamite Iranian god at Susa. Included amongst them are the famous stele of Naram Sin of Agade and the law code of Hammurabi of Babylon. So the, the object on your left dates to 2300 BCE in its origin, and Hammurabi's is about 1750 BCE. According to inscriptions placed on the ancient monuments, the Iranian king, Shushuk Nahunte, and he's about 1275 BCE, plundered them during his raid with the Babylonian city of Sippar, and then added his mark of possession upon them, booty of Babylonia, seen here in the inset. Beaulieu argues that the two objects, the stele of Naram Sin and the Code of Hammurabi, quote, must have remained in view at Sippar for 1,500 years respectively before Shutrik the Hunte carried them off to Susa. This desire to control objects and their biographies is perhaps best seen in the last phase of independent Mesopotamian history the Neo-Babylonian era, roughly 600 to 539 BCE. Archaeologically, Nebuchadnezzar II has been associated with a group of older sculptures found in or around his northern palace at Babylon. Amongst the finds are many sculptures and inscriptions from centuries earlier and foreign lands, including a statue of a lion standing over a man and a weather god from Neo-Hittite Syria, and centuries-old statues of the governors of Mari, which is on the middle Euphrates, and a worthy Neo-Babylonian foe. This area where the objects were found was originally called a Schloss Museum, palace museum, by the German excavators of Babylon. But others, other scholars have since noted that the objects were found outside of the palace. Whoops. Yeah, that's right, okay between its walls and the great processional boulevard leading through the city, rather than in some sort of interior room or discrete building. Nevertheless, most scholars accept that the sculptures were all stored and displayed together in official royal contexts at Babylon. The inscriptions of many Neo-Babylonian kings mention that they conducted excavations of old monuments at Babylon, Sippor, Sippar, and the city of Ur. Nabonidus claims in his inscriptions that at Ur, he unearthed ancient texts from the reign of Hammurabi and restored foundations and buildings in the sacred pre precinct of the moon god Sin because they had become dilapidated, and that's the word usually used to translate the Akkadian. He also took pains to set himself as a temple restorer at the end of a long line of Kassite kings who had restored the temples of Sippar. This antiquarian practice was described in a tablet listing several ancient inscriptions that the king's men had excavated at Sippar. Nabonidus' scribes, and by extension their king, demonstrate their antiquarian erudition as they stuck as close as possible to the original uh, authentic Kassite inscriptions by utilizing archaic cuneiform signs in their copies. And they apparently were pretty close, <laughs> uh, according to the, the, the textual scholars today. The king as temple builder motif also has deeply ancient origins in the iconography of Mesopotamia, 
The image of the king carrying a basket of bricks destined for a temple was utilized in Sumer since the inception of city-states and common until about 2000 BCE when it then dropped out of the iconographic repertoire. However, it was revived in the first millennium by the neo assyrian king uh, Ashurbanipal, our library guy, who restored Babylon after its destruction by his grandfather Sennacherib. Ashurbanipal reserves the temple builder imagery for his work in Babylonia. So both of these statues were in the south when his heartland, of course, is the north of Mesopotamia. Uh, the two steles on which we find his basket-carrying image found at Babylon and Borsippa are not unique shapes in the period, and there are many inscribed objects found throughout the empire and from early Neo-Assyrian reigns with a similar shape. They are typically life-sized or larger with a curvilinear top. Excuse me. Most of the versions date to the 9th century BCE, and they contain an image of the king in profile with a hand raised in a gesture of prayer or recognition. There have been all sorts of different interpretations of what and how this means. Some people think the king was like snapping and kind of throwing power in certain ways. Um, the sculptures can be freestanding or cut into natural rock faces. Symbolically, they index the person of the king whose hand gesture represents homage to the gods for perpetuity and confers their support of his kingship. While it is likely that he chose not to represent himself in such a manner, opting for the basket carrier motif, Ashurbanipal did preserve the memory of these earlier stele and their archaizing iconography. In a relief from his palace at Nineveh, he depicts a triple-walled city with lion and bull-shaped decorations on its facade. You can see them in the top part of the, the relief there. Most scholars identify this as his depiction of his grandfather Sennacherib's walls, which he also claims he restored when they had become dilapidated. A small arched, shaped, uh, arched shape, excuse me, cut into the facade resembles the shape of our hand gesturing steely. Uh, when, I've always thought it was an arched gateway. But looking closer, I think I see the outline of a figure with hand raised inside the arch. And ha I'd have to uh, check this, the original in the British Museum, to see this, uh, to confirm. It could be complete rubbish and my eyes just, you know, acting. But I know I see such a steely uh, in another relief from the reign of Ashurbanipal, where it is set in the landscape of his grandfather's aqueduct and gardens at Nineveh. Still standing, these uh, gardens and aqueducts, after, over a half century later. When we compare this representation of a monument to similar extant examples, it is clear that Ashurbanipal and his artists aim for an authentic representation of the antiquated stele and iconographic motif. If I am reading these images appropriately, Ashurbanipal chose, at least in two separate rooms of his palace, to represent old monuments related to kingly worship that were still standing decades later at Nineveh. These little details could not be overlooked in his depictions of the Ninevite, Ninevite landscape for the very same reasons that the monuments themselves had to be restored. They were associated with proper royal religious behavior and recognition of the legitimacy conferred by the gods upon the kings. By including the little antique sculpture in his images of the Ninevite landscape and deliberately, deliberately choosing the archaizing iconography of the temple builder in Babylonia, Ashurbanipal connected his forefathers to himself and their auspicious religious behavior and monuments of the past to the fate of his reign in the future. Although antiquarian tendencies were certainly present in Mesopotamia earlier, notions of an authentic past which was retrievable, collectible, and reshapable for the purposes of collective memory in the future emerged by the mid-first millennium BCE. The collecting and antiquarian behaviors of the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian kings have long been noted in the scholarly literature, and I build upon them here. Yet the precise mechanisms in relation to the forging of collective memory have not been explored fully. The elites of Mesopotamia explored the ruins of the past in a multitude of ways and targeted to specific audiences. Ashurbanipal revived two archaizing icon iconographic motifs, the basket carrier, <coughs> excuse me, the basket carrier for the Babylonian context and the, the gesturing king for Assyrian audiences. 
describes reshaped concepts of antediluvian wisdom by collecting ancient tablets, copying them precisely, and adding their own colophons. The royal elite displayed antiquarian behaviors through their use of heirlooms to ward off pain and disease in their bodies. And the king sought out collected, authentic, ancient texts and objects related to conquest, lineage, and divine legitimacy, often reinscribing them with their own labels. These numerous and diverse cases of antiquarian behavior demonstrate that the courtly elites of Mesopotamia manipulated the remains of their past in order to take part in the construction of collective memories for the future. And I thank you very much. questions all together at the end. So um, our next paper in this session is being presented by our own Felipe Rojas, one of the conference's organizers. And it's called Connoisseurs, Amateurs, and Poseurs, Local <laughs> Interpreters of the Past in Roman Anatolia. Thank you, Johanna. So the main question I want to address today is the following. Who in Roman Anatolia was interested in local antiquities? Who were the antiquarians? I'm going to focus primarily, though not exclusively, on interaction with remains that predate Greek and Roman presence in the region. In other words, with objects and monuments that we would date to the Bronze and Iron Ages. My talk is going to be divided in three parts. First. Uh, I will show that interest in material remains existed, um, although specialists sometimes deny it. Then I'll offer a sample of its specific manifestations in, in, in Roman Anatolia. And finally, I will try to uh, throw light on the fact that many people engaged in dia dialogue and debate about local antiquities. It, it's going to be sort of a debunking of three <coughs> myths. The first is the myth of oblivion, that there's a, there's a dark age that separates Greeks and Romans from whatever was there before. The second is the myth of Greek exceptionality, which sounds really weird to people who don't do classics, but the classicist historians uh, have said and repeat, uh, even in the face of post-colonial scholarship, that the Greeks were the only people with a sense of prehistory in the Mediterranean, and then other people sort of adopted Greek prehistory because they didn't have their own. And finally, the myth of purity, which has to do with what Peter Miller talked about uh, yesterday, which is the fact that many people engaged in antiquarian practices and not just people that we recognize as antiquarians because they look kind of like early modern European antiquarians. So first, the myth of oblivion. Um, I'm going to begin by focusing on Hellenistic and Roman interaction with Hittite, Luvian, and Assyrian remains, since it is often stated that the Greeks and Romans knew nothing about the Bronze and Age cultures of Anatolia. A prominent Hittitologist recently concluded that the lands and kingdoms of the Hittites appear to have sunk into oblivion, and there is not a trace of them in Greek texts nor in any other uh, post-Bronze Age document. I have uh, studied these recently in, a, in, a, in an article that is published in the Journal of Mediterranean Archaeology, and my strategy for studying these monuments was to not look for Hittites, sorry, not look for Hittites in the Greek texts, but sort of look for Greeks and Romans in the Hittite monuments. And if you do look for Greeks and Romans in the Hittite monuments, they're everywhere. These things are not particularly inconspicuous, and uh, they're never buried. They were always exposed, and people interacted with them constantly. So I'm going to give you three examples of the type of interaction that existed in these monuments. This is uh, in central Turkey. Um, in ancient Lycaonia, the, the monument at Kizilda. At Kizilda, uh, there was a, a Hittite relief, and, uh, and a Greek priest performed a set of dynamic jumping rituals at the relief. And the reason we know this is because the priest proceeded to inscribe what he had done, both by making uh, these uh, footprint incisions right in front of the relief, but also by literally just saying what he had done. So Kratidus, son of Hermophrates, the priest, jumped. <laughs> For, presumably to his death. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, a second example. The second example is uh, Fasilar. Uh, 
the this is the biggest Hittite sculpture that has ever been found, and it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the what you see on the on, on the right is a is a is a replica that, is, that stands in the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. Um, the monolith was probably carved for uh, inclusion in a in 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 a in a one of these pool complexes such as one of the Flat and Pinar, perhaps specifically for for a Flat and Pinar. But what I want to talk about is not the Hittite life of the monument, but rather its life in the Roman period. So you have, uh, on the right, you have a map that I don't expect you to understand. I just want you to show that the, the monolith is uh, the, the thing with a yellow square around it. And every single one of these um, uh, numbered circles is some sort of Roman period intervention. Almost all of them are, 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 are tombs, but they're also little shrines. And there are also there's also a well and and a little fountain house. The most elaborate of these interventions is a shrine that you see on the upper right, which uh, was made for a local hero called Lucianus. And when there, the the most obvious question that I thought we could ask was, what what's going on between the the, the shrine, the Roman period shrine, and the Hittite monument, and um, and why exactly? Um, was it carved there? Again, an inscription throws some light on the matter. This is an inscription that is right uh, below the shrine, and it stipulates a set of fair play rules for athletic competitions that are going to be held between the monument and the the between the monolith and the shrine. And these are these are super inclusive uh, athletic competitions. Slaves and freedmen can 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 compete. They're they're meant to be uh, like fair play, so people can't can't win many times, it can only win once. Anyway, my, 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 mon my article was about only interaction with Hittite remains. But you could do this with Assyrian remains, and, and, it, and it would look similar if you look at it from the Roman period. So I'll give you just two examples. The relief at uh, Uzunolan Tepe that I heard last week had been destroyed by dynamite, and uh, another one at Chad Bashe. And uh, at Uzunolan Tepe, <laughs> The, the, the intervention is enormous. There's a, there's a Roman period temple uh, circled in, 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 in yellow by the relief. Mm -hmm. And there's a Roman period necropolis around the relief. Um, so so you, could, you, could, you could apply this, this strategy of investigation of these monuments with, with other types of reliefs. Um, all right. But the evidence, apart from what I did with Valeria Sergenkova in that article, has, has almost never been analyzed simultaneously. Even synthetic studies insist on Greek and Roman indifference for local antiquities. In a recent volume on the history of ancient travel in Anatolia, Nicola Zwingmann argued that, quote, there are only a few references in the literary tradition to the material traces of non-Greek cultures in Asia Minor. And she concluded that Greek and Roman travelers paid virtually no attention to the material traces of other cultures from the Bronze and Iron and from the Iron Age. So the alleged descent into oblivion of the Bronze and Iron Age cultures of Anatolia, that total rupture that supposedly severed the Hittites from the Greeks and Roman observers, has analogs in the historiography of other periods and places. And this is important. Historians of archaeology have repeatedly argued, for example, that Muslims were utterly uninterested in the material remains of the pre-Islamic past. In his monumental history of archaeological thought, Bruce Trigger gives the reasons for the supposed lack of interest. But such assessment can only stand if we accept a brutally monolithic view of Arabs and Muslims, or Greeks and Romans for that matter. In fact, it is easy to point to many people at different moments in Arab lands who were not just interested, but actually connoisseurs of pre-Islamic antiquities. And I'll give you three examples. The ninth uh, century Yemenite scholar Al-Hamdani wrote a treatise that dealt with the great pre-Islamic remains of the Southern Arabian Peninsula and he copied and translated inscriptions in pre-Islamic writing system like Sadeq. Uh, the 12th century Mamluk polymath Al Idrisi wrote at length about the Egyptian pyramids and explored them personally. Uh, Al Idrisi's father is said to have speculated about how to date the biblical flood by analyzing the sediment that accumulated between the stones of the pyramids. I think even Trigger would have to admit that sediment analysis would count as using material remains to learn about the past. This is as close as anyone got to an archaeological endeavor in the 12th century. Um, in order to avoid the risk of anachronism and teleological explanation, to avoid exploring ancient engagement with the material remains of the past merely as the precursors of our own, we should not 
We should ask not whether capital A antiquarianism existed in the Muslim world, it, it did, or in Roman Anatolia, but rather what did interest in the past look like in those times and places? What is antiquarianism in Roman Anatolia? To that question, I will now turn. Um, and so here is the, the myth of, of Greek exceptionality, but, I, but I'll get to the myth of Greek exceptionality by trying to write or to show you what an antiquarianism without text would look like. Um, one of the most important contributions of early modern antiquarians to historical methodology in Europe was the demonstration that material remains such as coins and monuments could be used to reconstruct history. It is thus a paradox that so much scholarship on antiquarianism has relied almost exclusively on texts. Somehow the opportunity of writing history with things continues to be missed when it comes to writing the histories of the antiquarians themselves. It is, it is, it is doubly perplexing that the early history of archaeology, as written not just by Trigger but even by Alain Schnapp himself, has been written again largely on the basis of ancient texts. Archaeological evidence of archaeological or antiquarian endeavors is almost entirely neglected by Trigger and used only sparingly by Schnapp. So would it be possible to tackle the question I posed at the beginning of this paper using primarily archaeological evidence? The classical text, um, sorry, the classical text um, would, would seem to suggest that it would be possible. Think, for example, of the extraordinary antiquities said to be shown to religious pilgrims and other travelers throughout the Roman East. An anchor of the Argo, the breastplate of Hector, the dagger of Memnon, a letter of Sarpede on the breastplate of Pharaoh Amasis, not to mention the ubiquitous tombs of Greek and Trojan heroes and the fortifications and waterworks of Ninos and Semiramis. Note for a moment, just in passing, that the, that the horizons, the memory horizons that are invoked by these objects are not just Greek. Some are Greek, some are Roman, some are Egypt, sorry, sorry, some Egyptian, some are Mesopotamian. Um, anyway, uh, here, here's a list from an actual collection, the, the, the so-called Lindian Anagrafe, uh, an inscription recording the gifts to the Temple of Athena, uh, Lindia. And these, so these are the actual objects that were kept there or were said to be kept there. Um, so what, um, what did antiquity look like and feel like from the perspective of the inhabitants of Rome and Anatolia? I'll, I'll give you again, very briefly, some examples that I've published in the, in the Schnapp volume. Um, in the city of Sardis, in the Roman period, about the third century CE, uh, lions were collected and, 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 and appreciated greatly. This is one of the most interesting uh, assemblages of such material. It, is, it, it has three bases and three anthropomorphic, uh, sorry, three zoomorphic statues that all are about a thousand years old at the moment of collection. So the Roman collector somehow knew that these things were archaic, that they were Lydian, and that they went together. That's, that's one example. Uh, the, the, the horizon that was being invoked by such things is, is the, the Lydian imperial horizon, which is which is represented here by the, by the coin of, of Croesus, the golden coin of Croesus with a lion goring the bull. So at Sardis, you had collection, and what was being invoked was a Lydian horizon. I'll give you another example from a, a, a site that several uh, that worked in La Branda in Turkey again. Uh, and, and here, what I want to talk about is architectural replication. So the most impressive monuments at La Branda today are not the temple but rather a series of dining halls, of giant, uh, elegant temple-looking uh, dining halls that were built in the fourth century BCE. At some point in the Roman period, somebody at Labranda decided to make a replica of these uh, Hellenistic dining halls. And I have, it's not, it's not very well preserved, but the, the original Hellenistic dining hall is, is in the blue and the replica is in the red. And you sort of have to believe me because they look kind of the same size. The replica is, is smaller, but what it, what it definitely is, 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 is poor in construction. It doesn't have this, this massive, beautiful ashlar. Uh, here you have another, another version of that replica. The, the, what, what is interesting to me about this is, does this have a, like an embodied dimension? When people replicate a building made for dining, do they also then have dining practices that are archaizing? Are these people engaged in, in weirdly hecatomnid feasts of what they imagine to be the Persian past? The, the building is more complex than that, and I wish I could talk about it at length, but one of the other ways in which antiquarianism is, 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 is visible at La Branda is that in that building, 
was found the most famous of all the Brahman sculptures, which is the Sphinx, which is from the fourth century BC. So somebody in the Roman period got Sphinx from, from the different, from the older Andhra uh, uh, Hall and brought it to, to this replica of the past. And very, very briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, a, a different type of antiquarian engagement, which I have called very awkwardly, and, and I need a better name for this, uh, the monumentalization of inconspicuous landmarks. These two reliefs are from the city of Aphrodisias, and they were made in the first century um, AD, and they celebrate Aphrodisias' supposed founders. Um, the founders that, that these reliefs celebrate are Minos, Semiramis, and Gordis. So Mesopotamian kings that are said to be the founders of the city of Aphrodisia. Aphrodisia did not have a past. Aphrodisia did not have lions or sphinxes or any of these things. And so what, what is being uh, framed by, by these reliefs are a series of, um, of other prehistoric anthropogenic things in the vicinity of the city or in the city itself. One of them is the, the habitation mound, the prehistoric habitation mound, which, which you see here we're embedded in marble, but, but the thing is just a, a, a tell, just made of human remains, human anthropogenic remains. That's one of the things being invoked. This is a, this is a hill of Semiramis. Another thing, uh, another one of these objects being invoked is, is are the fortifications of, of fifth century BC date around the city. We know that one of them was called Gordiotechos, meaning wall of Gordis. And Gordis is the guy who is being celebrated in those reliefs. So what is happening in Aphrodisias, a city that did not have this abundant sort of portable um, um, remains of the past, is that the tell could be celebrated with this new invented tradition about the deep history of the place. Um, I guess to, to wrap up the second part of my talk, what I want to call attention to is that this, this notion that the only available path for the Greeks and for their neighbors as the Greek past is it's bananas, it's not, it doesn't work. The people are, are celebrating other pasts, and I've shown you Lydian ones, Carian ones, and Mesopotamian ones. Uh, and finally, the myth of, of purity. Um, so I hope that this whirlwind survey of evidence has demonstrated that in Roman Anatolia, many different people were in interested in the material remains of the past. To conclude, I want to examine some of the relevant textual evidence and to consider the dynamics of dialogue and debate among various individuals and communities with antiquarian interests in Roman Anatolia. Let me begin, however, with a discussion of a poster that Silvanus Morley, one of the most distinguished Maya archaeologists of the early 20th century, put up in the 1920s when conducting fieldwork in the jungles of Petén. The poster announced in Spanish that Morley would pay a reward in, in gold to any gum harvester who would provide him information on ancient Maya ruins and inscriptions. It also instructed the Guatemalan gum harvesters to report to the local priest or to two other intermediaries who would presumably give them their reward and relay the information to the archaeologist Morley. This is just to say that the dynamics of antiquarianism and archaeology in Petén or in Pisidia are complicated and often involve social and political asymmetries such as the one that obviously existed between Morley, his intermediaries, and the Chicleros. I, alas, cannot provide you with the ancient version of Morley's poster, but obviously it existed. I, I have avoided until now mentioning Pausanias, uh, who is a native Anatolian and who is the paradigmatic Roman period antiquarian. And I have avoided it because um, he's often accepted as a precursor of early modern European antiquarians. And he, 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 he sometimes looks so much like them and, and to some people even like us. So I've, I've avoided it. Uh, but in the writings of Pausanias, we get a glimpse of the ancient equivalent of Morley's Guatemalan priest, his other intermediaries, and the Chicleros. Those, those, uh, um, Christopher Jones, among other people, ha has thrown light on Pausanias' interlocutors, including the local guides who were specialists on a re in a region's antiquities. They were not like Pausanias who traveled Greece and knew about the monuments all around Greece. These guys were only specialists in, in their local antiquities. Um, since the 19th century, and especially after the publication of Christian Habicht's monograph on Pausanias, uh, 
The Description of Greece has been considered an exceptional book. Scholars have called it the most important book to have survived from antiquity for archaeologists. For Anatolianists like myself, for people working on Turkey, the book is somewhat less interesting because Pausanias mentions his native land relatively infrequently and almost always in passing. It is a shame, then, that the writings of Gaius Licinius Mucianus, or as somebody at the Institute for Advanced Study last uh, week said, Mucianus, did not survive because, <laughs> <laughs> did not survive because Mucianus was a Roman politician who um, traveled extensively through Anatolia and was deeply interested in its antiquities. So this guy, Mucianus, inspected the roof beams of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus read a letter in Lycia which Sarpedon had allegedly dispatched from Troy. He counted the threads on the breastplate that the pharaoh Amasis had sent as a gift to the temple of Athena Lindia. None of the writings of Mucianus survives, and we know about his antiquarian endeavors only from brief mentions in his contemporary Pliny. Many of those passages can be used to reflect about his interaction with local and foreign interpreters and connoisseurs. So the guy Mucianus, bemoaned the fate, this is the passage on screen, he bemoaned the fate of the woven breastplate he saw at Lindos. So many people had tried to count the threads on the breastplate that it survived only in tatters. He questioned the authenticity of the letter of Sarpedon uh, because it was written on papyrus, and according to Mucianus, Egypt did not yet exist in the time of the Trojan War. In Ephesus, he doubted stories about the antiquity of the wooden statue uh, of the goddess, because if they were true, he said, the statue would supposedly predate the goddess it commemorates. This guy's a true connoisseur. As, as George Williamson has shown, these are all arguments made with agonistic intent. Mucianus um, was in competition not only with other learned pil pilgrims, but also with his own informants. You can imagine this guy sort of being taken up to the temple of, uh, to, the, to the roof of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus um, and, and being led by a local Ephesian and being dismissive of the Ephesians' story about the temple. Um, th thus, too, this, thus too did early modern and modern antiquarians rely and dismiss their local guides. And this is something that, that, that Ben has, has written about eloquently. So when it came to knowledge about material remains in Anatolia, the distance between experts and what the Greeks called idiots, normal people, was very narrow. Competition and disagreement about the meaning of those remains and about how ancient observers were connected or not was the norm. How are we to define, analyze, and compare these interests in the absence of an emic concept of antiquarianism? And what does it mean to speak, um, what does it mean to speak of antiquarianism before the European age of the antiquaries? In a recent piece exploring the implications of, of Momiliano's famous essay for the study of Chinese antiquarianism, uh, Lothar von Falkenhausen defined antiquarianism as, quote, the systematic preoccupation with the material remains of the past, motivated by an interest in the past as such, and attempting to bridge a rupture in transmission. I like von Falkenhausen's definition because it is explicit, as he is always, and very clear, but in practice, in practice, all three of its components pose major interpretative difficulties. What is systematic enough? Pausanias, scholars are agreed, makes a grade. Perhaps Mucianos would have made the grade. But is their systematicity simply the result of the fact that they could travel and were rich and could compare? Would the Lydian guides and other such regional specialists not have been systematic, even if it was at a small scale? Clearly, those guides were knowledgeable about the antiquities in their region. Does that make them antiquarians? For Momiliano and for Felix Jacobi before him, antiquarianism was characterized not just by systematicity, but also by a lack of interest in political events. This distinguished them from true historians. But can interest in the past ever be that, the only interest in the past? I would argue against Momiliano and against Jacobi that most antiquarian endeavors are always motivated by complex reasons, political, religion, religious, and as, as Peter Brown once reminded me, even fiscal reasons, because you get tax exemptions. Uh, the, the, the past is, is important mostly because it matters to many people in the present. In Roman Anatolia, knowledge about the material remains of the past was gained through interaction um, between the various parties interested in them. So when the poet, the poet Lucan has the general Julius Caesar and a Phrygian shepherd come face to face in the ruins of Troy, 
the material remains of Troy matter for different reasons. Caesar has an ulterior interest in connecting Rome to Troy and a specific version of that, of the story of that connection that suits him in the present. But the, but the two characters can still contest each other's knowledge and authority. Rome and Troy, general and farmer, local and foreigner, the oppositions in, in Lucan's vision are almost caricaturesque. But even in that fictional scene, what is apparent is that neither of the observers is alone. Despite the huge cultural and political distances, there is some common ground that permits interaction. The common ground is what the Mayanist Morley tried to produce with the awkward, awkward plea for stones drawn or carved with figures and letters. Finally, how great a rupture must there be in order for somebody to feel the need to build a bridge? I began this talk by saying that classicists and hittitologists were agreed on the fact that the Bronze and Iron Age civilizations of Anatolia were unknown to Greeks and Romans. The ancient authors themselves uh, had said that. So Diodorus of Sicily began the second book of his antiquities saying, in ancient days, there were indigenous kings throughout Anatolia of whom neither the names nor any deeds of note are remembered. And then he goes on to write two books about the deeds and names of these people. <laughs> um, uh, so did, did Kratos, the priest in Kizilda, or the collectors of Lydian lions in Sardis, or the erectors of Andron Sea in Labranda feel a rupture? Perhaps they did. And the bridges they built were made of actual stones. One possible answer to the seemingly straightforward question of who in Roman Anatolia was interested in the material remains of the past could be a list of all those people that I have discussed. Historians, local antiquarians, tourist guides, religious officials and pilgrims, Roman generals, Phrygian farmers, Lydian Jews, civic ambassadors, aristocrats, uh, artists, architects, poets, thieves. The list could go on, but it is already so heterogeneous that the reader might think that an answer to the opposite question would be more instructive. Who in Roman Anatolia did not care about the material remains of the past? I obviously will not try to answer that question. <laughs> those interested were many, connoisseurs, amateurs, posters. That's a matter of perspective, but not a trivial one. Trigger restricted his monumental book to cases that involved, quote, deliberate use of the material cultures of the past to learn more about the past. If we accept Trigger's definition, the early history of archaeology in the Mediterranean will have to be rewritten. So much, and so for the last paper for um, this this part of the morning, we have Steve Kosibo from the University of Alabama, and he'll be talking to us um, about ancient artifice presenting the past in the Inca Imperial Heartland, Cusco, Peru. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, for the invitation, Felipe and Ben, and thank you, of course, to the John Carter Brown Library and Joukowsky Institute for sponsoring this event. Um, it's a hard act to follow Felipe, but I think I could pick up on some of the strands that he left dangling uh, that were so perhaps enticing for a further conversation. Uh, and also following on some of Peter's comments last night, which forced us to think about these past loving creatures uh, perhaps whom we know or love ourselves. Um, I'm part of this section of the entire day largely as a challenge to think about antiquarianism before the European age of antiquaries, which then as our uh, organizers put together so skillfully, uh, forces us to also think about uh, whether there was or what could have been an emic, an emic concept of the antiquarianism in these other cultures and societies of the past. Uh, this is quite a challenging question, and I think it bridges what Peter Miller was talking about last night in terms of thinking about past loving creatures. Uh, for me, it raises the additional question of what is an emic or different category of the past, because we often assume as if the past itself is something knowable that has the same kind of ontological status to which it is attributed in, in our society as well as other types of society. I'll add to that the additional challenge uh, perhaps I'm the only person here uh, presenting on a particular society that may have had a kind of antiquarian practice, but without any kind of textual sources to which we might be able to refer. And so that'll build quite nicely, I think, on what Felipe set up for us with his talk. Um, 
I'm drawing on some of my recent research. So some of you in the room have seen me present on this quite recently. And also uh, drawing on some conversations I had with some of the people in the room here. The last time I was at Brown, I spoke about my research uh, at Wainakari. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Wainakari was a major Inca shrine and temple located at the center of their empire and literally at the heart of their capital city of Cusco. It was a place where the Incas became gods, a place where one of the four ancestral Incas would said to embed himself in the mountain, to become the mountain. And then it also became a place of initiation, where young boys would travel to become Inca, to visit this ancestor slash mountain slash place. In other words, it was the past. And last time I presented some of the evidence from my recent excavations and talk to especially a few of you about those excavations, uh, especially Felipe, who is particularly drawn to a find, this kind of challenging find that many archaeologists have in the field when they find something that seems uncanny or out of place. And this is often what I think the antiquarian object would look like to many of us if we didn't have the textual sources explaining us to us what they are. So this is one side of the shrine of Wainakauri showing a bit of our excavations at a building that adjoins a large ritual area. And within that building, we found, oh, sorry, mixed onto the Inca floors, the remains of fragments of pottery that could be pieced together to form full vessels of a prior civilization, in this case, the Wari Empire and the Tiwanaku Empire, empires that preceded the Incas by at least 500 years throughout the Andes. And so part of uh, my challenge in the field was to think of, well, why are these objects here? How, what, what brought them here? And what kind of perhaps past loving creature may have recognized these as the past much in the same ways that we do as archeologists when we encounter them in the field? And that started a series of conversations with Felipe, as well as with uh, Peter Van Damblen in the room and talking about the ways that these ancient empires may have used antiquarian-type objects. Um, I plan this part of my talk in a bit more of a conceptual frame. I'll return to Wainakauri once I think we've dealt with this first question that I posed, which is, what do we mean by the past when we talk of other people's pasts? And can we assume that those other people recognized, perceived, or loved their past in the same ways that we might, or discard, forget, obscure their past in the same ways that we always do? So you're looking at a notebook of Max Ule, who was, of course, one of these major archaeologists and antiquarians who worked in Peru. This is contained in the Ethnology Museum of Berlin. And I'm showing this to you because I'm starting to think, should we assume that if we find objects of this sort with, associated with present objects for the people whom we excavate, that they have the same kind of meaning they may have had for Max Ule, meaning that they're representations, tokens of a type, of a certain people, place, or time. And then this requires us to perhaps think of the relationship between the antiquarian as person, as subject, to the past as object, as that relationship is mediated by things. So in these particular examples here, we see, uh, who is this, Dominica of Vivon Devon, is that right? I thought I had it written in my notes, but, but the no, the no, okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the notes aren't showing completely out of my pen time scrolling through them. Anyway, so French artist from Napoleon who sketched a lot of the Egyptian remains, obviously a kind of sub subject object relationship implied through the practice of drawing and sketching. And on the right, you see your speaker in the uh, Ethnology Museum of Berlin taking up what you kind of see me in kind of ghostly image. Uh, taking a photo of Inca objects contained within cabinets that I had spent the entire day drawing and then reflected on this very moment of this kind of subject-object relationship that is mediated by the thing and that then creates for us conceptually this object of the past. And this seems to me to be this, this, this move, this conceptual move of the European form of antiquarianism that we've been challenged in this particular section of the entire day to rethink in terms of perhaps other concepts. So what are these, the basis of this? That's loading strangely. Okay, but what are the bases of these uh, European notions of antiquarianism? We could rely on perhaps a couple of quotes obviously chosen uh, by me for some, sense, some sake of humor to a certain extent. But uh, there's an appreciation for aesthetics. Okay, so the object of the art known through its style, 
known through uh, particularly its attributes. Here in John Earle's quote, uh, using the original spelling, a man strangely thrifty of time past, an enemy of indeed this maw, whence he fetches out many things when they are now all rotten and stinking, he is one that hath that unnatural disease, which I'm sure we could also call love for the past, to be enamored of old age and wrinkles and loves all things as Dutchmen do cheese. The better, uh, no accident there, Peter. The better for being moldy and wormy. <laughs> Uh, so perhaps not the aesthetic that we think of when we think aesthetic and beauty, but obviously an appreciation for the characteristics and attributes of the objects that form a kind of superficial or kind of aesthetic relationship, and without dwelling on that point in a Kantian sense of the aesthetic, an immediate relationship between subject and object known through those attributes. Uh, there's a certain kind of historicity implied when we talk about European antiquarianism as well. And here, Dominique Vivon Denon again, uh, here uh, dedicating his book of drawings to Napoleon to combine the luster of your name with the splendor, uh, that's Napoleon himself, with the splendor of the monuments of Egypt is to associate the glorious annals of our own time with the history of the heroic age and to reanimate the dust of Sesostris and Mendes, who like you were conquerors, like you benefactors. Right, so the hubris of empire, and perhaps a kind of early humanist view of, of universal histories. And then finally, the empiricism that I think uh, all, all of our speakers so far have mentioned, uh, captured by uh, Momigliano, but also by Sir Richard Colfor, which is we speak from facts, not theory, and the kind of apolitical idea of antiquarianism that we often see that, uh, of course, Felipe just mentioned. Do we see this translatable, these kinds of ways of thinking of, of antiquarianism in terms of aesthetics, historicity, and this brute empiricism in other contexts, like Tawantin Suyu, where I study the Inca Empire and then specifically at the center of that empire in Cusco? And this becomes my question driving the rest of the talk. Advance. OK. Easy answer, no. We don't. <laughs> and the harder answer is perhaps we shouldn't, and we shouldn't even bother looking in that sense. We should sense to interpret how these people of other cultures or other societies or other times interpreted themselves, recognized, or presented the past in their own times. So my title is not presenting the past, it's presenting the past. <laughs> um, how in absence of text do we do this? <coughs> Largely archeologists and ethno historians studying the Inca empire are particularly drawn to a previous empire called Tiwanaku. And these are perhaps the people who made the pottery that I found at Wainakari 500 years per before the time that it was found. Um, Tiwanaku was based a little bit south of the Inca empire around Lake Titicaca. Tiwanaku is famous for its massive monoliths but also drawing on textual sources, archaeologists and ethno-historians will often speak of Tiwanaku in these kinds of mythic terms. They'll call attention to the ways that Inca elites or other Andean elites called attention to Tiwanaku at the time of Spanish conquest as a place where non-human beings resided. And I didn't, there, there could have been many citations here, but I didn't want to fill the slide. A place where people resided, but they turned to stone because they had rebelled against the social and cosmological order. A place war of gods place where a creator fashioned different types of human, or a place where the ancestral Incas first emerged before going back underground and then emerging at Wainakari. These kinds of notions of Tiwanaku seem to frame it as an Egypt to Rome, or a Greece to Rome, in the same sort of way in the ways that the Incas may have reflected on it. Now, an entire talk could be given about the claims to history that are that are occurring at a time of dramatic conquest and social upheaval. I'll leave that seed planted and move on to perhaps the empirical reasons why we might not consider Tiwanaku in this sense. So first, in considering ancient Andean antiquarianism, beyond these textual sources, what might we have archaeologically? Do we have representations like this is the raising of the obelisk in front of the Vatican? Do we have the movement of large-scale sculptures, stone objects, out of their place at Tiwanaku or other sites, or at Wari, or at Chavi, in an earlier civilization still, and into places of Inca importance? What might examples of those be? None. The monoliths were still in place. The Incas would have visited them still in place. They did not remove them. They didn't remove ceramic objects. 
They didn't remove the fabulous Lon Dawn of, Chief, of, of, of uh, uh, a Chavin. They didn't remove any of the mummy bundles, and hence the massive looting that occurs after the arrival of the Spanish. The past was left, our past was left under the earth as part of what we can call nature. The great gateway of the sun of Tiwanaku would have been seen perhaps like this by both Inca and early photographer. Do we find something like an early cabinet of curiosities then? Perhaps those pots, sherds that I found at Wainakari represent a kind of collecting or a smaller scale notion of taking some objects from the past gathering them together in specific kinds of displays that may have been very important to ritual events. And on the right, you have the examples we have from the Inca Empire. None. We don't find massive assemblages of Tiwanaku artifacts. We don't find assemblages of Wari artifacts, Chavian artifacts, anything really from previous peoples. Perhaps those Incas didn't recognize them as previous peoples. All of these great art objects that we associate with people like Tiwanaku, for example, in this slide, are not found in Cusco, are not found in Inca sites. And perhaps I'm wrong because we haven't done the amount of research we should be doing, and there has been a lot of looting. But in terms of the systematic research we have done, we don't find this kind of collecting. So how might we reconsider then Andean antiquarianism, if there was one, or an Andean notion of the past in this case? And to add to this, the practices with which some of these objects were associated are not found among Inca ritual areas. These are snuff tablets of the Tiwanaku Empire and were very important to ingesting certain kinds of drugs that would have been associated with ritual events. Now, they're found in every Tiwanaku context, oftentimes in graves as well, but not a single Inca context. So there was a complete shift as well in cultural practice that was associated with some of these key artifacts. Now, before moving on, I would be wrong to not state that we do have something. And this is the something that oftentimes archaeologists draw on when they're talking about the reuse of the past or the creation, invocation of social memory within the present. And it's a kind of architectural archaism. And again, that should be another seed that perhaps I could plant for further conversation later about the difference between archaism and antiquarianism. But here, a lot has been written about similarity between Tionaku stones and Inca stones on the top. Although architectural historians have also written that these were made in very different ways. And on the bottom, a lot has been written about temples, early temples of the Kotosh religion dating to about 2000 BC and later Inca temples that both feature niches. Although again, architectural historians have written that there are great differences in how these things are made and the materials with which they're made and the dimensions at which they're made. I'll return to that point in a second. What else do we perhaps have? And there's a great history of the Incas stealing sacred things from the people whom they conquered. These things called wakas. Wainakari, which, with which I opened my talk, was also a waka, a sacred place or a thing. And what they were so interested in this was the material itself. So on the right, you see a photo taken by my friend Johann Reinhard, who uh, this is a great photo because it's showing how the waka itself is an assemblage of things, including both clothing and stone. And so it's part of it. It's material, and it also exists in its parts. In other words, if the Inca stole this, but somehow one of these people were able to run away with the hat, they still had the waka. In other words, the materiality of the thing is very important to it. So at first, the making. Second, the materiality. And third, selection seems very important. This may have been important to our European antiquarians as well. But for the Incas, they take it to a different level, where it's about the material and not the aesthetic. So here we have stone quarried from Rumicolca, a massive andesite quarry to the south of Cusco, stone that has been found as far north as Ecuador. So the, for the Incas, it was very important to use this particular stone, this particular andesite, which does have a very high mescovite content. It does shine in a beautiful way, but they could have found other stones of that type. In other words, this was not a token of a type, andesite. This was Rumicolca andesite which cannot be compared to other things. And I think that we can think that way about these objects of the past. Sometimes they're not tokens of a type, past. Sometimes they are this object of the past, that object of the past. They don't invoke or index, in this sense, a general past. A lot of my research has investigated this question in thinking about the transformation then of materials and of places. And one famous example of this in the Andes is what the Incas are concerned with in terms of the past which is building directly on the past through use of materials from that place. 
This is Pachacamac on the coast of Peru, where we see an older temple built of adobe and the newer Inca of temple, the older temple there, and then the newer Inca temple behind it built of adobe from the same site. So in terms of an Inca notion of constructing a past or presenting a past in this particular way, it seems as though we don't necessarily have the importance of aesthetics, a sense of historicity in which a deeper past is connected to a present, or the empiricism that we saw with European notions. And of course, I'm really overgeneralizing. <laughs> but we have an importance of materiality that perhaps is a bit different, not reduced to aesthetics, the importance of selection of things from particular sources, perhaps sourcing would have been a better word there, and a notion of sequence, or things that are presented in direct sequence to one another. And so this perhaps gives us insight into a different way of seeing this. So I'd like to briefly now talk about how we might reinterpret those ceramics. This is based now, again, on the conversations I had with Felipe and Peter, in which I remember talking to Peter, and we we're comparing this to a Roman display of obelisks in their capital city. And I said, well, I guess if we compare this to the Incas, it would be almost as if the Incas needed to get the Egyptian obelisk and completely smash it and reduce it to dust so they could then use it to construct something. <laughs> so materiality, selection, and then sequence, the sequence then being putting things in association with one another. Part of my research at Wanakari was looking at that initiation rite called Kapak Raimi, and that's the rite by which young boys became Inca. And we mapped this out by finding the roads that would have been important to the ceremony, in particular this ritual road that leads from the central plaza of Cusco to the site of Wanakari. And as it ascends Wanakari, passes a series of other archaeological sites, all of which are named and all of which were part of a broader Inca ritual system called the Seque system. So there are places of offerings and sacrifices and places with which stories were associated. This kind of stuff was recorded by the Jesuit chronicler uh, Bernabe Cobo about 100 years after the fall of the Inca Empire. In thinking of that road, I thought about sequence quite a bit, about the presentation of a certain sequence of places and what that does for people's experience of the sites. For along the road, you walk through Muya Urco, a mound, occupied during the fluorescence of the Tiwanaku and Wari empires, a huge site called Kotakai, a village that was occupied long before the Incas. And as you would walk through these areas, the initiates would have no doubt, again thinking of the subject-object relationship and how the past is created through that relationship, they would have no doubt seen a lot of pottery sherds on the surface, just as we can today if we were to walk that route. Excavations on the road, not mine, but uh, by the Ministry of Culture in Peru uncovered that this is an Inca road. It was built by the Incas. They connected these sites, in other words. They created a sequence out of what was perhaps not a sequence. Maybe people walked this road before or walked this path, but certainly they did not walk a formal paved path. So they created a sequence. How did they do so? What's the materiality of creating the past in Wainakauri? Well, Wanakari, and this is partially from uh, what we talked about last time, I spent a part of the summer doing some geological <coughs> research and collaborating with the geologists and looking at the geomorphology of the mountain itself. Wanakari is a particularly powerful geological process. It's not just a mountain. Looking at the geological map, and something I cannot explain uh, right now, although I could, um, we see that there are reverse faults in this particular area of Cusco, which produce uh, what we call overthrusted which means overturned or recumbent folds. And so on there you have a picture from a geology textbook showing you the first two kinds of common folds, but on the right, the less common fold, one that's produced by a very uh, strong tectonic event, which basically means in layman's terms, you're taking your stratigraphy archeologically, shooting it up into the air, and then so it falls horizontally onto the surface of the earth, okay? And so what's this doing is exposing very deep strata of sandstone and mudstone throughout the entire area of the mountain of Wainakari, the only area in Cusco where we see this. Here are the two shrine sectors of Wainakari. Moving back to what I showed you before, we can now take a different look at these massive sandstone strata and realize that these are part of a very old geological event, something that's obviously visible on the surface, and something that here perhaps ironically, are associated directly with where they placed the pottery. Here we see some of those exposed surfaces from the Eocene, Oligocene. These are uh, gray and red sandstone beds. 
and here we see the mudstone uh, strata, okay? And the mudstone strata would be from an ancient lake bed. Here we see the center of the shrine at Wanakari, one of the shrines, the one surrounded by the wall that's located a little bit farther down from where we found those earlier pieces of pottery. And you can see, I usually have a little advancer. <coughs> see here, <coughs> we already told you that this is really old mudstone onto which they're directly building this zigzag shaped wall at the center of their shrine to make a platform. So in other sense, the materiality of the place of the mountain itself becomes important to a claim about the past. The past is reconstituted and presented through the way that they're shaping the mountain. Here we see a floor level from our excavations directly again on top of that mudstone layer. We can recall then too this sequence of sites through which initiates would have climbed, a sequence of sites that they would have seen and as they're climbing that sequence, they would have passed these interesting yellow sandstone beds with also mudstone toward the very bottom, again showing pieces, parts of an ancient lake bed. But in this case, near the sites of Kodakai in that earlier Middle Horizon site, that's the time period that we associate with the Tiwanaku and Wari, they would also see fossilized diatoms from the lake bed, if they were so, uh, uh, I guess, empirically oriented as the uh, <laughs> antiquarian might be. So it's a very ancient environment. It's an ancient environment that presents itself to the viewer, especially the viewer who is paying attention. Uh, one would think that during a ritual procession during which you're becoming Inca and a ritual procession during which you're stopping at particular sites along the way, like Kodakai, which I just showed you, Matawa, which I'm now showing you, one would perhaps pay attention to these things, especially if these are named sites, wakas, places of the past. What did the Incas do at a site like Matawa they created a past in the present, largely by destroying a village that was there beforehand. They created a ruin, in other words. This is where I'm going to be excavating this coming summer. Here's what Matawa would have looked like prior to the Incas. A staircase was built through it so that the initiates would have moved directly through it as they climbed to Wanakari. So they would have gone through this very old geology and then entered a very old place, a ruin. They would have entered the past. As the Incas did this, we found in our preliminary excavations here, smashing of particular kinds of vessels located underneath the roadbed. So we see a creation of the past, almost a reverse antiquarian kind of practice in the sense in which they're creating a past by destroying the things of the past. They're creating a ruin by smashing these kinds of vessels, in particular vessels with face effigies, perhaps representing the people that were there beforehand. At Matalo, when they're building the road, they're also digging into some very deep red clay sources that only exist in this particular part of the mountain. Here's the road on the left, the red clay source on the right. That red clay is then used to bond the walls of Wainakari as well as make the floor levels that would be necessary to bond the bottom of the temple buildings to that mudstone on which it's built. <coughs> so again, another kind of association in sequence, and there you see that red clay as it's banded through the floor levels of Wainakari. They actually developed this really interesting stratigraphy in which the red clay and probably the actual laying of the red clay, the event of putting it down into the site was very important to a constitution of an idea of what this past place was. That's not to say there's no functional reason for putting red clay up here. Of course they needed red clay, but they chose that red clay source that they had to dig as they were destroying Matawa to use for this particular area of the site. And so here you see some of that architectural bonding, the andesite rock, the mudstone, and then the red clay layer, which would have caused a series of sequences in the practice of making the site, which would have caused a relationship between the subject making site, the object being made, that would have been meaningful in the sense of perhaps invoking a sense of the past. Here's that road showing you the connection between these different areas. My claim, and I've just published a recent article on this called Tracing the Past. You can see it on my academia.edu site if you're so interested. But another article will be soon coming out as well with the geological research that we've done this last summer. Uh, and you see that the initiates would have passed directly through these sites. This uh, not so fancy GIS analysis here shows you that they didn't have to pass through these sites. The blue line shows you the least cost path that they could have taken. Made basically the easiest, quickest way to get to Wainakari. This was not it. 
So the sequencing, the connection of the sites in this sense was not necessarily just functional. So how do we return to these objects? Well, that still is a bit of a challenge for me. But the way that I'm interpreting it is that if we have an Andean framework, if I'm somewhat right that different people think of the past in different ways, and that their notion of the past may be politically inflected, uh, religiously symbolized, culturally learned. In this case, it seems as though associations between objects and between sequences of things and places were more important to the Incas than perhaps a linear or abstract idea of all things past that can be connected along a calendar line. And so in this case, it may have been very important for the initiates to take these objects from an earlier age and bring them to a place of an earlier age, thereby reifying or practicing, realizing this connection or association between two places of the past. In this case, maybe these are not necessarily offerings, but it's sort of a practice or part of a generalized practice of creating associations, associations between those things of the past along a line that they're walking in which they are actually in the past, in a mythic world, part of that mythic world. Now, I don't have any time left, but I'd love to talk to any of you about this because I'm thinking of this in semiotic frameworks, but also in terms of what uh, psych uh, behavioral psychologists call an allocentric orientation to space and objects because I'm working with a linguist on this and we're thinking this is perhaps what the Incas were up to in creating something like this, is creating something that can be read object to object as opposed to read by a person by looking at a thing relative to a larger conceptual structure, language, or writing, or something of that sort. But the easier take-home point than that, which is still one I'll be developing through time, is to start thinking perhaps of the process of making, the process of raising these kinds of monuments, and the process of selection, the process of the, the ways that materials are used, the ways that they may have, through time, been preserved, and thus this may have something to do with their selection for later use by later peoples. Because this has a lot to do then with the ways that these different species or creatures who may love the past may be able to communicate about the same thing, to be able to think in terms of those common elements and identities. One thing I loved about your talk yesterday was how you were saying we can recognize these vast differences, but that doesn't mean that these things are not understandable across time, that, that the, the distinctions are very important as well as calling attention to those commonalities. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate any comments that you might have after the fact. Thank you. speakers and, and it was a, a wonderful panel. Um, let me just again remind us of the, the questions that we were supposed to be thinking about. So what does it mean to speak of antiquarianism before uh, the European age of the antiquaries? And how do we define, analyze, and compare antiquarian traditions in the absence of an emic concept of antiquarianism? And apologies to Steve where you go, for mispronouncing your title when I introduced you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> presenting rather than presenting. Um, yeah. So, um, questions, things that people would like to, to discuss. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, please. Can I ask a question for Steve, really? Yeah. Um, so much of, of the power of, of your argument was about this notion of association mm -hmm. as a kind of semantic category. Is there any way to recover how the Incas thought about association? <coughs> Uh, yeah. Um, well, that's it's a large part of what I'm trying to do in thinking about practice and applying practice theory to the ways that we can look at construction, destruction, and then also the orchestration of ritual events at these places. So part of what I did here was thinking about the connection of these dots along the land and how that may have created a certain sense of association. What I didn't do was talk about uh, the entire seke system, which is this part in part to answer your question, and to think that this is one particular set of associations amongst others. So for those who may not know, the Seke system is a series of pathways throughout all of Cusco. This was one pathway on the Seke system. This is one pathway that in particular seemed to invoke something of a distant past, and I could have gone into detail about each one of those sites along the way. Um, and that distant past was seen to be only knowable by being in the places and by making those connections by moving through them. Now, to answer your question in part, we could walk all those other lines 
and note, and note the differences between them. That would be sort of phenomenological methodology for getting to that kind of, that kind of question. Uh, in another sense, I think what we can do archaeologically uh, is, is look at the kinds of practices or the ways that the Incas themselves assembled some of these most important practices and rituals as part of their empire and to think about the associations that were important to them. Perhaps something like the, the perhaps everyone's seen here, the National Geographic discoveries of the so-called Ice Maiden and whatnot with all of the objects that she has with her. And this is a fascinating kind of moment in, in what we've been talking about throughout the conference because you have all these photos online that you can see of the excavators taking the maiden and immediately what's the first thing they do is separate all the objects and put them on bags that are labeled and categorize them as such, artifact, <coughs> ecofact, wood, stone, uh, ceramic, and whatnot. Without then, perhaps one thing we need to do is start thinking more in terms of those immediate relationships that can be both spatial, temporal, and, and material and, and in their context in that way. Like a catalog. Yeah. Yeah, and then think about a catalog that perhaps is like a ra relational database is perhaps what we need to start thinking in terms of that network that's within these smaller scale contexts. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a footnote, I think, to the whole discussion, but <clears throat> one thing that kept coming up in my mind was the uh, process of looting, which began in antiquity largely, as I understand it, for uh, precious metals and things like that, fortunately for the archaeologists today, because they left behind what didn't have much value in antiquity, but today does. And then, of course, looting eventually became, the, the objects that didn't have intrinsic value became uh, uh, an object for the, uh, for the looters. And I'm wondering when that happened and if it's possible that there were ancient looters who went for objects that didn't have strictly intrinsic uh, value. And, uh, so if there's a black antiquities market, essentially. Well, and then of course, uh, the whole excavation, uh, I was struck by the number of images in Allison's uh, talk that were credited to the British Museum. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was a huge looting, if you will, of, of antiquities by the uh, Western Europeans uh, during the 18th, 19th century. But anyway, does anybody like to comment on that? It's just I say something. Actually, I could, there's a lot of textual stuff I left out of my talk because I really wanted to get some of the imagery and the, the archaeology in there. But there are many, many tablets that talk about um, tablet collecting. And there's one in particular, a letter from a, a, father, a son to a father. I think it's Babylonian, I can't remember if it's old or new or middle. <laughs> um, and, and the son goes, Dad, go get me some more of those little round cylinder seals. I need more of them. He says, go find them wherever you can, dig in the ground. Um, and it's not clear why he needs them, um, whether it's <coughs> some sort of material or for reinscription or the apotropaic, I think, is a huge part of the materiality for Mesopotamia, at least. Um, but definitely, but it's not, you know, of course, looting has legal connotations. It's very modern. So there's definitely digging. Um, and digging for what and why is, is the question. Um, but there's also digging and looking at the associations objects have with buildings, for example, in Mesopotamia. You know, I found this old st statue, and it's in the old temple, and I'm going to restore it and put it back onto the new temple where they should build over. So the, the, the other thing that I kept thinking about is what are ancient conceptions of mounds? Um, and this works in the Middle East particularly because mounds are typically cultural, not funerary or something. So um, I think in Felipe's talk, he mentioned the mount, the first site in Anatolia. It was a mound um, and the, the Greek priest was, a pre, uh, was attracted to it um, and I wonder why, you know, I mean, there, were, there was the, the, the Hittite stele there, but was it also because he, did he know it was cultural or did he think it was a funeral mound? You know, I'm kind of wondering. Or did it I matter? Think, I mean, that, so the, 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 I made two comments. First, I'll, I'll talk about what you said and then about what you said. I think that the history of looting in antiquity needs to be written because motivations as looting today are multiple and because the idea that that it's just about gold is wrong. Um, 
there are several examples I can give you. The most obvious and the most famous one is, is, is the digging of so-called necrocorinthia in Corinth, which is ceramic, because there was a craze for these archaic ceramics in Rome, and so people were, were digging them up. There was also a craze for Corinthian bronzes, and those were faked. And so there were experts who could tell apart fake bronze from real bronze, and they did so through smell. Um, so, so I think that the history of Lutin is great, and somebody should write it. But the, 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 about the mounds, I think that one of the interesting questions about attention to mounds in Anatolia is that I think the categories are different. I think that, mm. that, that, that these people are not necessarily making differences between natural mounds and anthropogenic mounds. Uh, it's obvious that some natural mounds are considered <coughs> anthropogenic, and, and it's also clear that some anthropogenic mounds are considered natural. And this has repercussions, I think, for the history of Antiquarianism more largely because that's also the case with inscriptions. Some people, for example, Persepolis, which seems so obviously anthropogenic, in, in, in Europe itself, there were people who thought it wasn't anthropogenic, that the cuneiform was natural. And the opposite is the case in, 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 in America, that, as, as, as many of you know, Inscriptions in, in pre-Columbian scripts were found all over the place, including the Amazon, and there were lavish editions of the supposed inscriptions of Amazonian stones. So, anyway. Oh, wow. yes. I'm thinking about um, the Felipe talking about embodiment and um, embodiment, uh, reenactment, performative relationship of the body with the object and sense of priority. Um, we've not heard the word pilgrimage, we've not, uh, you know, which, you know, brings all these associations of our own modern time, but, you know, in the way that you're talking about these paths, certainly, uh, <coughs> that comes to mind. And I'm wondering, like in the, in the jumping ritual of that Roman priest, um, you know, or in, um, uh, records of actions uh, that are happening. Is it the is it the ritual? Is it the is it the gesture? Is it the action at that place that is important? And then the inscription or the physical marking that that comes later. I mean, is there looking at the rituals? Is there a, a hint of you know what was was it the actions and the embodiment that was the focus, the re reenactment of ancient traditions? You know, you had this. Allison, um, the gesture, you know, um, was that a gesture that was conducted and then was just memorialized by that image, or mm, um, is there a, a, a reenactment going on as well? Right, uh, and, and that's really fascinating because some of those stele are inscribed into rock faces, and people imagine they were, you know, sort of marking the territory of the empire, of the Assyrian Empire. So, for example, uh, one of the Assyrian stele in Anatolia, you see them all over in Lebanon and Syria, and, and they've been traditionally interpreted sort of border markers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, I conquered this area. But they also are now, in Omar Hermancha, who was here, and other people are seeing these steely rock faces as sites of ritual mm -hmm. and performance. So it, it's very much involved in sort of creating the world and, in, and inscribing, bringing that world into the realm in a very sort of cosmological and ritualistic way. So even the gestures might be antiquarian. <laughs> yeah, and that's not clear. You know, there aren't any in the later period of the Neo-Assyrian. I haven't found these mm -hmm. um, in Assyria. Now, I think there there might be, and it's funny, because the, the curvilinear shape gets carried on, and that's why it's sort of this index, right? But what's on it changes a little. Yeah. So in later stele, you see Isar Haddon um, standing, and he's got two uh, captives at his feet. Or there's another stele I didn't even show you from Ashurbani Paul. It's a stele of, we think, his own reliefs. And it has the curvilinear shape, and it shows him hunting on horseback, hunting a lion. And he displays it as part of his park. Mm -hmm. So you know. Those steely were important sites, I think, is kind of what I'm saying. But wherever they stand. May, may I add something? So the, the embodied antiquarian practices is something that I'm very interested in. And I just finished an article about embodied 
Persianizing practices in the Roman period, people pretending to be Persian. And I think a very good example that is, that is really remarkable, it's, 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 a, it's a textual example, but there's archaeological evidence associated with it, is that Pausanias, that traveler, sees a bunch of Persian priests with funny hats and, and self-combusting wood and, uh, and a bunch of really old books uh, reading in what presumably is the Avestan language, a ceremony that is invented. I mean, they invented the ceremony, but the ceremony is spectacular, and the ceremony is attractive, and the ceremony is a, is a, is a version of the past that you can see almost as a pilgrim or as a tourist. So that's, that's, that's I think, and, the, and there is archaeological evidence associated with these reinvented. And the, the cool, oh, sorry, one more thing. The, the umna tarashu, the, the, that, that, that gesture, there is textual Greek evidence of interpretation of what that is. And it's supposed to be a dismissal of, of, of the seriousness of the world because the, uh, the Mesopotamians are supposed to be oh, extravagant and luxurious, so that's oh. showing that they don't care about. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it in Can I add something? That's a great question, actually. I think it goes back to it, something that connects all of our talks. I mean, after all, if we're relying on textual sources or on the materials themselves, we often miss what's actually connecting those things, which are the practices in which people were involved, people, things, and places were involved, and that would be this kind of framework that we see here. After all, this ceremony of, of Kapakarami and going to Wainakari, if we, most historians write it as a series of, of events that would occur over a month, and archaeologists will write it in the same way <coughs> that I have in terms of the places, but oftentimes left out are all the descriptions that we have from early accounts recorded by the Spanish of, of just the, of the practices of singing, of people whipping each other's legs, mm -hmm. of uh, the, the uncle of the young boy denigrating him in different ways, of uh, him receiving his first sling, of running was a very important part of the ceremony, of running back to Cusco, not from here, but from the nearby peak, which either way, it's quite a distance. <laughs> so, so yeah, the physicality of it and the practice of it has something to do with the way that perhaps the past is invoked. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I, um, we could talk about these things all day, and hopefully we will talk about these things all day, um, but just in the interest of time, because we're already about 20 minutes behind, um, I think I'm going to drop this wonderful, wonderful session to an end.